I've started out in the U.S. Navy. I've done a variety of different industries, lots of companies I've worked for. And one of the things that I find across the board is an incomplete asset management strategy ends up causing lots of problems. Um, you can start anywhere you want around what we call the wheel of despair, uh, but you know, poor maintenance planning, uh, you end up getting consumed with breakdowns. You have a lot of Band-Aid maintenance, uh, repeat work, you know, your standards end up dropping, and you really end up with a lot of safety and environmental issues, as well as uh, you know, your reputation gets impacted at the end of the day. Uh, you can add in whatever in your mind <laughs> is an additional thing that can go in here. Uh, if, if I tried to put every possible issue that could arise, uh, you would never be able to read the words. But the point is, uh, we, you know, we don't have a complete and interconnected plan for managing our assets. Things quickly spin out of control and we end up in a state of chaos. So talking about the, the paper, we're going to talk a quick overview of what ISO 55000 is. Um, I want to talk about some of the pressures on affecting the industry, as well as some issues that we've seen with implementing ISO 55000 and then talk to some of the benefits that, that we see from implementing it and how we look at a, a simplified approach to the implementation of ISO 55000. And then I'll talk briefly about a, uh, a current uh, water client that we have, um, how they entered into the process, you know, what their overall structure looks like and some of the uh, good and bad things that occurred there. So to get into it, you know, we we know we're here for asset management. We know ISO 55000 is a is a standard for asset management. But I always like to start off and understand the definition of an asset. I think it's important to have that that discussion understanding. So you know, ISO 55000 says it's an item, thing, or entity that has potential or actual value to the organization. It can be tangible or intangible, financial or non-financial. So this paper is uh, focusing on the physical assets, mainly, um, you know, equipment, inventory, uh, properties that are owned by the organization. Um, briefly, you know, ISO 55000, we call it ISO 55000, but it's three standards, 55000, one, and two, with one being the uh, primary uh, driver for what a um, ISO 55000 compliant organization looks like, which is where this graphic comes from, speaking about you know, the context of the organization. A uh, great video that uh, Mike shared um, earlier. That was very nice. I like the way that put that together. And so you know, it was great and showed some of the information about what's in each one. You know, so for us, the context of the organization, you know, using the organization's objectives to drive asset management decisions. You know, leadership, we have to have ownership and accountability for asset management from top management. It's very difficult when, um, you know, the maintenance manager tries to implement ISO 55000 without top management. You're just not going to have the successes that you would with top management being involved. Planning, we're talking about you know, mitigating risks associated with the, the business planning, uh, with business continuity and assuring that asset management plans can achieve the intended outcome. In support, we have having the right people in the right positions doing the right thing. In operations, we're using the asset management tools to ensure reliability, performance, and quality. Performance evaluation, we're gonna measure how well assets, asset management, and the asset management system are working, right? It's no point in having it if we're not going to make certain that it's doing what we want and adjusting. And in any continuous improvement, we're making our adjustments, uh, we're setting our goals, we're monitoring them, assessing and implementing the improvements, and that is always an ongoing activity. So as I said, we're gonna you know, talk about the different pressures on the industry, and clearly there's environmental pressures, right? Uh, there's always, federal regulations, there's local state regulations. We're always concerned about you know, sanitary sewer overflow inspections, uh, 
water quality management, uh, just keeping certificates, right? Um, you know, I think the biggest pressure that I think is important about environmental is ourselves. You know, I know I want to protect the environment. I'm certain everybody else wants to protect the environment. So having our own drive to protect the environment is hopefully the biggest driver of all. Mark, I just want to reiterate that point. I don't want you to be the only one who is saying that. Uh, and I know the other speakers are going to be joining us uh, on the panel later, have children also, and uh, agree wholeheartedly with this. So thank you for the interruption. My pleasure. So uh, I actually have three different things I want to talk about with the, the social pressures. Uh, one of the big things I looked at is you know, there's a lot of people moving into urban areas. As you see, between 2000 and 2020, the urban growth was 22%, but the overall growth in the United States was 17.4%. So our urban areas are growing faster than the overall country. And that's going to put a lot of pressure on our, on our water systems. Um, you know, frankly, our water systems are, are old in a lot of cases. You know, there's a lot of them that have assets that are over 100 years old. So if you have a relatively finite amount of capital and you have more people moving into an area than perhaps you're expecting, where does your capital go to? Is your capital going towards just increasing your overall infrastructure to supply the more, more people? Is it in replacing uh, old assets? Having a good asset management plan and understanding where you're coming from and where you're trying to get to is really going to help. Uh, the social pressure. So the, the middle picture is uh, my wife and I during the uh, freeze in Houston in February. Uh, it was the first day, so we were smiling and happy because it was snowing and we had power and we had water and it seemed all good. Um, the outside pictures are pictures of uh, Houston's water, part of Houston's water system uh, a couple of days later. And we had no water, we had no power. We certainly would have liked it. So, you know, talking about extreme events, uh, you know, managing a, uh, expectations for the public can be tough. You know, we, we want our water when we want our water, no matter what. Um, you know, there's social expectations the companies provide. Um, I'm sorry. So it was tough, right? Uh, not enjoyable and everybody wants what they want. So there are social expectations of companies to provide uh, training, job progression planning, and engage employees to positively impact the organization. And obviously, ISO 55000 speaks to skills and RACI charts and you know, all of our environmental, social, and governance um, activities. So uh, it can very much help with all these as well. And then I want to talk about the technical pressures. So there's always technical pressures from a business and engineering perspective. I chose to cut, focus on a few. Uh, the first is, uh, you know, interconnected edge devices talking to CMMSs or artificial intelligences and CMMSs talking to third-party monitoring software. How are we going to put these things together? How are we going to deal with, with this? Uh, asset health index development. Uh, this has been a big thing in power. Uh, like to see us using it more widespread, but just wrapping our minds around what truly defines the health of the asset. And then how are we going to get all of the data into the right places and put together such that we can just have a simple, this asset is healthy, this asset is unhealthy. <laughs> and help us to drive our, our uh, monitoring that way and improvement. Obviously, use of machine learning and asset performance management tools is uh, very much a in vogue topic. Um, you know, these type uh, technologies, they really allow us to make the best use of the data that we have available uh, to prevent functional failures. So, um, and then use of risk-based inspection methods instead of periodic. So especially when you have a large number of fixed assets, finding ways to utilize risk-based inspections as part of your mechanical integrity program, it really improves your ability to execute the right work at the right time and provides clarity on your capital investment. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some studies out there, of people going out and, and trying to inspect 
you know, all of their piping in a five-year period. Well, if we take on a risk-based approach, I've seen where they've actually been able to break it down into, we have a higher risk area. Uh, we're gonna do those every five years. We have lower and lower risk and they're, they're extending those lifespans out to 10, even 15 years between the inspections, which is actually allowing them actually get all of it done without greatly increasing the cost. So those are the pressures. And now I want to talk about some of the issues that we've encountered. So, you know, there's it's, there's a lot of siloing that goes on in different organizations. Obviously, in, in water and wastewater, we have water supply and treatment. We'll have wastewater treatment. Uh, we might even have water storage and, and power generation all coming together. And they're all kind of different divisions, and they all have different goals and, and directions they want to go. And understanding that it needs to come from the top and it needs to be driven down that everybody needs to come together and understand what everybody's trying to achieve and write an asset management policy that's going to satisfy everyone's needs and drive everyone in the same direction. Uh, just raising that up to a new, another level actually helps with manpower as well, because now you can have a fewer number of people affecting the same changes throughout the organization instead of each individual silo having all those people and then fighting against each other. Next issue we encounter is knowledge. Uh, you know, this can range everywhere from just knowledge of ISO 55000 and the, and the understanding that it's the top management that's really needed to drive things all the way down to, I call it the, the, the bottom up, the granular uh, approach that's needed to meet the requirements of ISO 55000. So we kind of have that strategic coming down and we need to have the base that builds up from below to, to create the system that works. So things like data gathering, cleansing data uh, for your assets, simple reliability processes such as creating a master asset list, doing asset criticality ranking, um, determining the right maintenance to do, how are we going to stock spares, what spares are we going to stock, um, identifying failure modes. So all things like that not existing is, is really quite a problem. The next issue is leadership. So we keep talking about top management needing to own it. And I commonly see that there's a belief that asset management happens through the engineering or the maintenance department. Uh, you know, we, we've had this conversation, Mike, that the uh, reliability to me is a lot like safety is, that it's only when the or entire organization is understanding it and driving it that it's going to be successful. So. Top management finally understood that, hey, we have a problem with safety. People are getting hurt. People are getting killed. We need to do something. So they didn't just hire in a safety department and say, make us more safe. And it just happened. They hired in a safety department and then they bought into it. They put out safety policies and said, these, these are our goals as an organization to be safe. And oh, by the way, everybody's involved in safety. You have a responsibility to, to keep yourself safe. You have a responsibility to keep uh, help keep others safe and, and to help the organization as a whole. So when reliability reaches that level, that's when an organization is going to be reliable. Mark, I think that's one of the best examples of how uh, we can pray that asset management moves into the business culture and the analogy between an individual's safety and the cost to the organization if there is an injury and lawsuit, et cetera, got everyone's attention. So unfortunately, we've had to wait until organizations see the cost of not being resilient in the face of continued climate issues. I'm not gonna say change, I don't care what's causing it, it's happening on a measurable level. And now organizations can see the same uh, cost to their to them as they did to the individual. So uh, real good. I look forward to helping you promote that uh, in uh, ever widening circle. Appreciate that. I, you know, there's always been an interesting kind of correlation between safety and reliability. 
that they always say, you know, organizations that are more reliable end up being safer as well. Um, but I've never seen a direct causal you know, relationship established by anyone. Um, it's, it's very clear that there's been studies that show more reliable, more safe. And I always wonder why it is. And one of the things that in my mind, it always it, it, uh, sticks out is when you're doing the same thing day in, day out with the same equipment and it operates properly, you have your standards, you have you know, your operating uh, parameters, you have your, your modes of operation and you just, you do what you're supposed to do. You're safe. When your equipment's not reliable and you start to have failures, nobody wants to hear we're not going to continue to operate no no no. we, we got to figure out a way to keep this going so no matter people, what no yeah. matter what we got to keep yeah. this running so now you start taking shortcuts you start doing things that are outside of the norm and when things are that's when we get hurt is when things aren't normal we're yeah. trying to do something that we would not normally do and i truly believe that there's a, a very direct correlation between reliability and safety from that perspective uh, yes so continue on on yes, the- Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. No, yeah, thank you. That was great. Um, you know, lack of understanding of the benefits of good asset management, uh, failure to provide true executive sponsorship. I think we talked through that um, very, very clearly. And the last one is confusing asset management from a commercial perspective with asset management from a equipment ISO 55,000 perspective, right? I know it's not only just equipment, but uh, just the concept of what is an asset and what is asset management. Uh, you know, you Google asset management and how many uh, wealth managers do you end up finding, right? So just that the wording ends up being confusing for some people and, and getting the leadership to understand the difference and then embracing it is a challenge. And then to uh, governance, right? So we often see that we get in there and there's either no asset management policy at all, or somebody in the organization realizes that they need an asset management policy and it's not been signed by top management. Um, having no strategic asset management uh, plans in place, no asset management policies, um, and poor or no management of change. So why ISO 55,000 then, right? So for me, it provides a framework. We're taking all of these pressures, all of these issues that we have, and then we have the tools that we, we know that exist. We're marrying up these tools and with these pressures and issues. We're looking at all our risks and we're putting them together through this context of these elements of ISO 55,000 and documenting it in such a way that we're actually mitigating all of these risks and, and difficulties that we have, all these pressures that we have in order to manage and mitigate them through this process. More benefits, I mean, they're both internal and external, but focusing a bit on external, right? We're fostering stewardship and sustainability across all of our asset classes, uh, reductions in operating costs, we're always looking to be more competitive. We're always looking to beat budget targets. Um, improvements in safety results that uh, reduce for likelihood and severity of accidents as we just discussed. Uh, advances in the performance and reliability of public works and private sector manufacturing and processing facilities. Uh, enhancing accountability and transparency for all stakeholders. I think that's probably one of the biggest ones for me. And then, obviously important, especially in this industry, is extend the useful life and value of facilities and equipment. And then resilience, right? So with resilience, I like the fact that ISO helps us clearly identify our reliability weaknesses, and then we can actually address them to increase the resistance to failure, which is part of our resilience. The other option is if we find that we cannot increase the resistance to failure, then we can develop a risk mitigation plans for the known potential failure. I think this actually speaks back to the winter storm URI that I spoke to earlier, right? That in Houston, they were very prepared for heat. They're very prepared for humidity. They knew the cold was coming. They, they know it happens. They didn't expect it to be that long. 
um, but they really weren't prepared for what happened. Uh, they didn't really have a backup plan. It was all very, let's wait till it breaks and then fix it at, at that point. Um, it was a run to failure um, plan, which run to failure is great if you planned it that way and probably would have been perfectly fine in the situation, but they could have identified the uh, assets that were going to be at risk from such a freeze and made plans for how they're going to be addressed after. And, and finally, in a, in a nutshell to me, you know, it tells your stakeholders, you understand your business, you know your risks, and you're prepared to manage them. So I always like to go and look and see, you know, what kind of organizations are actually certifying uh, to ISO 55000. So I sorted the list. I know it's not, not quite up to date, but I still think it brings some, um, some good highlights to where we are. So I just did this in September. I looked through, uh, there are 304 certified organizations in the world in 46 countries in 21 different industrial sectors. So that was up from 168 companies, organizations in 2018. Uh, Australia being the, the, having the highest number of certified organizations and 61 of the organizations were in the water and wastewater sector with 29 of them being in Japan alone. So almost half were just in, in Japan. Um, the most striking thing for me is that there were zero certified, ISO certified uh, organizations in the Americas. So interesting numbers. Uh, before you go on, I do have to uh, say that the Asset Leadership Network through uh, the US uh, Technical Advisory Group to ISO 55000 is addressing this website, which is called the known certified organizations. And there are some issues about how they're reported and what counts as a certified organization. So this is a good bellwether you know, overview, um, really gives an understanding, but there are certified organizations in the Americas. Um, we're, we're having presentations uh, by uh, some of them, including uh, one of our organizational members, University Health, which is in San Antonio, and our ALN Espanol is including discussion about the uh, many uh, electrical certifications in uh, South and Central America. So I'm very happy that the US TAG has joined the ALN as a member, and we are working with them to uh, create a website to help clarify and refine some of this information. But thank you. Mark, for providing this. It's a very good overview. It's important for people to understand that America needs to catch up. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say you had some water or wastewater um, certified organizations in that list, Mike? Um, no, your, your representation of the list is, in terms of water and wastewater, is the most, uh, uh, the best understanding that I know. The other one is uh, electric utilities in Central and uh, South America. I believe uh, Brazil, uh, one country in South America requires electric utilities to be ISO 55,000 and one certified, so. Thank you. So I just wanna talk about, you know, how we're approaching simplifying physical asset management. Uh, you know, we, we start off with organizational alignment, you know, it fits very well with the context of the organization, you know, really educating and engaging leadership and stakeholders to align our asset management objectives with the environmental safety and governance objectives of the organization. So once we have everybody on board, we've got the, uh, an asset management uh, board in place for the organization, we have top management support. You know, we look at the next thing being data alignment. So what is it we're trying to manage? What assets do we have? Have we actually populated whatever system, computerized maintenance management system, EAM, with the physical assets that we're trying to take care of and then make certain that we have good, clean data in there that's gonna help support our ongoing efforts. Uh, and then process alignment, that's everything from 
you know, how are we going to do our asset criticality ranking? How are we going to optimize the maintenance for our assets? How are we going to do our work management processes? Uh, how are we going to, uh, who's responsible for what? Um, and who's going to manage the improvement? And then we get into performance alignment. So for us, having that visual, uh, visualizing meaningful metrics. So, you know, very often we have spreadsheets with numbers and maybe some colors, but just having something that is very, you know, eye-catching and, and very easy to glance at and say, everything's good, or, oh, there's a problem area here that I can then drill down into, uh, really simplifies um, knowing if things are going well or not. And obviously driving those metrics and KPIs uh, with line of sight to the organization's objectives is very important. And then finally, we look at future alignment. So once we have everything else in place, we're looking at implementing those cost-effective either asset performance management, uh, artificial intelligent machine learning capabilities and, and getting them integrated to our systems. Uh, the goal is always to maximize our knowledge while minimizing the effort it takes to get that in there. So we do it in a phased approach. Uh, we look at phase one, we do a, a gap analysis. So we have two sorts of gap analyses. One is a simple, are you compliant with ISO 55000 checklist approach to, to that. And the other one is a more granular, um, as I spoke about before, having a, a bottoms up approach. You know, are we doing all the things necessary? Is our CMMS capable of supporting what we're trying to do? Are we populating the data in there? Are our work management processes in place? Uh, all of that goes into it. So we often do that for clients to, to help them uh, build a, a complete plan out. Uh, from that, you know, identifying where are we going to improve, right? And coming to sort of a consensus uh, among the stakeholders with, with what direction we're going to go. And then one of my favorite things is, is about the communication plan. Um, we'll talk about it briefly in a, in a minute um, as well. But part of a change management, not management of change, but change management for an organization is, is communicating what you're trying to do and why you're trying to do it. So at this phase, getting it ready so that people are going to understand uh, what kind of organizational shift we're looking to make. In phase two, we're gonna get our, make certain we get our asset management policy in place, our strategic asset management plan, right? Um, the roles and responsibilities, our roles and responsibilities to me is extremely important to make certain that everybody understands who does what. It's not so that each person understands what they're supposed to do. We have job descriptions to do that. And that's typically what we find. We go in and like, well, who does this? Uh, I think so-and-so does it. We need to look at their job description. So it's very easy for gaps to form if you don't have good role and responsibility charts. Then we create a, a project plan and then we're gonna execute the communication plan. We're gonna put it out there to people. What, what are we doing? The, the communication plan that we had just developed in phase one and then start developing asset management plans uh, according to the criticality of our assets. Phase three, we're looking to, to educate all of the stakeholders on what we're doing. We're gonna be measuring progress and, and making adjustments. We have to be flexible, uh, take kind of a bit of an agile approach to our project management throughout this, that if things are going really well, uh, we need to take advantage of that. Um, too often we look at risk as only negative, there's positive risks as well, and we need to be ready to take advantage of those positive risks when they come about. And then certification and continuous improvement. Um, you know, one thing we've been talking about is, is, is how to do certification and the difficulty of having all of our asset management plans in place. And I think it's really interesting to look at it and say, how about we just certify certain assets to ISO 55,000? Still get our asset management policy in place. We'll still have a SAMP. We'll still have some asset management plans, but we won't go all out until we're, until we're ready, right? We can get started without going all the way. So talked a little bit about man, uh, change management and it's really about transformational change to the organization. Um, so I say, you know, define the change, uh, communicate to the organization why it's important. We have to credibly lay out the benefits 
uh, that are expected to the stakeholders that are expected to change, right? They need to know what's in it for them uh, in order for them to go, you know what, I wanna get on board with this. It's gonna help me. It's the what's in it for me. <laughs> and then capabilities. So we've got them excited. They know what we want them to do, but they don't know how to do it yet. We need to give them the capabilities. We gotta train, uh, gotta educate, and, and make certain that the people we're expecting to help us down this road can do what we want. And then project, right? Managing this change as a project, get milestones in. And then for me, one of the biggest things too is celebrating the change. Uh, as we're progressing, don't wait until you have ISO 55,000 certification and yay, we're gonna celebrate. We have an asset management policy, celebrate it. <laughs> we have our strategic asset management plan in place, celebrate it. People get excited when they see that we're, we're happy and we're moving forward, that there's progress being made. And then routinely measure the change, be ready to adjust plans as I talked about. And then the last one's always a bit difficult and it's, it's obstacles. Um, I've seen it. I've seen individuals that stand as obstacles to the change that are not perhaps even quiet obstacles. They are out there saying, this is temporary, it'll pass, it's just another fad, uh, forget about it. Uh, there's different ways to handle those people. Obviously, the, the best thing to do is get them involved in the project, <laughs> make them responsible for part of it, make them, make them part of the, you're responsible for the success, your job's uh, on the line for the success of this project. That always helps. Um, but as a final alternative, I refer to a speech that Admiral Thad Allen gave. Uh, he was a former commandant of the Coast Guard. He gave a speech to the ALN in 2016. And he said that he was willing to disband his entire engineering department of 600 people and outsource engineering to any entity in the world that was able to help him improve his mission success. He didn't have to, it got their attention, um, but he was willing to. Sometimes we have to be willing to move the obstacles in order to help us succeed. Mark, thank you so much for sharing that. And can you go back? I always catch it right before uh, you switch your slides. Uh, there's been many comments about the clarity of your slides. And I just wanna really emphasize this one. All you're asking is for an organization to embrace transformational change. And you said that so simply at the start people, this is a really big deal, but there are many precedences of organizations who have done it and have reaped dramatic benefits. So this is really, you know, preaching to a, you know, we want to be preaching and evangelical about this. We, the society needs the dramatic improvements that all organizations can achieve through asset management. Everyone's pointing to problems. Uh, we have a very fallible uh, a solution that everybody can follow. So thank you for putting this out there and emphasizing the fact that as much, this is as much cultural as it is technological or business process. And that's very important. I just wanted to interrupt you one more time. No, uh, no, no I, what you're doing. <laughs> I, I find the psychology of asset management to be very interesting. It's uh, we, it tends to be a very engineering centric area and engineers are uh, obviously known for not being the most uh, interested in the psychology of things, right? It's, it's black and white. We do this, we do that. We do it because there's a reason. There's, there's a physical reason why we do it. And we commonly forget the psychology involved. Um, even though we don't think about it, we're still affected by it, right? We still we still react to the same human emotions and, and uh, pressures and, and desires as everyone else, but we don't necessarily sometimes think it's necessary in business. It, it should, just, should just happen. It's the right thing. So, <laughs> Well, since I've got you uh, off your presentation, uh, we've got a great question, and I think this is a, a good time to bring it up. Uh, Mark, any examples come to mind that show how ISO 55000 based change management helps organization capitalize on the opportunity to initiate an ever in ever changing markets. So what 
are you seeing any, now this is something we're gonna be addressing in a six capitals uh, presentation on uh, Wednesday, October 27th, but do you see any ripples up to, um, I think there's a few parts of it, right? Okay. Uh, it's it's not a stagnant system, right? You don't you don't put a asset management system, asset management policy, strategic asset management plans in place and say, okay, that's done, move on, right? It's always a, it's always continuous improvement. It's always monitoring. It's always measuring. Um, having a strategic asset management plan should it, you know, you'd be reviewing and updating that annually. And that would definitely be a driver, right? Is, is, and that's how you're going to stay resilient to all these in, uh, influences um, is understanding that and having the right people in place on that, as I call it, a, uh, your asset management uh, board for your organization that um, I didn't really speak to that earlier, but those, that should be made up of you know, more than just an engineering slash maintenance department uh, right. Operations needs to be in there. Your safety people need to be in there. Human resources. We need all these people that have all this knowledge because it all fits together. So once we have all those people together and that knowledge of what's coming coming down, we can react and uh, react proactively. <laughs> yes. To manage it. So, so um, I, while you, you were uh, giving your answer, it occurred to me that one of our speakers from next week, DC government initiated an information management system that improved their Moody's bond rating. Hmm. So that was a direct impact on uh, capital markets, if that's what the question was about. And I think that's what it is. Okay. So it is possible to, to correlate asset management to that. And then Chris uh, asks about uh, ROI on implementing ISO 55,000. And I'll address that, Chris. We have started a program with the Australian Asset Management Council, and on November 9th, we'll be having our second presentation called Value and Benefits from Asset Management. And that is uh, where people will be presenting their specific ROIs in whatever terms they define. So we see that there's a lack of specific ROI information and we're trying to build that up in this relationship with the Australian Asset Management Council. Okay, sorry for interrupting you again. Go, return to your normally scheduled presentation. That's fine, uh, tangible and intangible, financial and non-financial. It's, right. <laughs> it's always a challenge, right? I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll actually speak to it a little bit more because you know, I, asset management, ISO 55000 is, is, is great because, again, it's more than just physical assets. But I've been talking about reliability for assets for a while, and it's, it's always the challenge um, for various reasons on the ROI. Typically, okay. an organization that needs that help is not in a position to understand where they're spending the money in the first place. Their data isn't good. Um, they might know I'm spending X number of dollars on maintenance a year. And then after we've um, done a program, they may spend Y dollars. Uh, the issue ends up being that once they understand, I've been a maintenance manager. If you gave me a budget, I spent it um, just, just the way it is. And I'll, find a, I'll find a place to spend my money. So <laughs> if the number used to be $100,000 a month, and suddenly I'm only spending 70, I found $30,000 to spend that money somewhere else that I needed or I felt I needed somewhere else in the area. So that was a difficult one to find. Right. And then looking at it at an asset, individual asset level, um, generally the KPIs, the metrics, uh, the way people track the information in the CMMS was not accurate enough. They weren't putting in labor hours. They weren't actually putting uh, parts against the individual asset. They may have just been issuing them directly to nothing. So there was no real clear, easy way to end up having the, that discussion, um, which is why I believe there's, there's a lot of lack of information out there um, on ROI. Yeah, so uh, connecting that information all the way through is gonna be addressed by the Department of State on November 10th. Sorry, I just keep on turning your presentation into a commercial for <laughs> our future programs. Uh, like I said, please continue. 
My pleasure. So <laughs> this case study that we're talking about, um, you know, it, it, it's it's an interesting one. They, they actually had uh, hydroelectric generating stations, dams, spillways and weirs, <clears throat> excuse me, water treatment plants, pump stations, tunnel systems. And of course, they had lots and lots of pipe. So as I discussed in, in the way we approach these, this in phases, the first thing we did is a gap analysis. So this is the results of the gap analysis that we did. As I said, we, we base it, it's almost 600 questions. We break it down into seven elements and then the ISO is woven into this as well. So we looked at CMMS utilization, inventory management, their life cycle strategy, um, their organizational readiness, um, performance optimization, the reliability strategy and risk management, I'm sorry, work management. Uh, so their organizational readiness wasn't bad. I know this, this looks uh, like they're way down. Uh, I'll speak a couple of things to that. This was not a unusual scoring um, uh, organization, right? It's, it's fairly typical to see scores around this area. The, the reality is they actually did quite well in the life cycle strategy. So looking at um, how do I, you know, when am I going to do uh, capital investments and why um, looking at design for maintainability, design for reliability, um, asset disposal at end of life, those types of things kind of roll into life cycle strategy, uh, turnover of the assets on commissioning, all that falls in there. And, and they did quite well on that. And even work management and their, their CMS, they, they were doing quite well. So their main areas were inventory management and, and some reliability strategy. So I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit more about what we do in there. Can I ask if the gap analysis was based on the ISO 55001 structure? It, it has ISO 55001 structure embedded, if that makes sense. <laughs> There's more to it than just that. Yes, but it exactly. is right. It's the yeah. it's the strategic ISO fifty five thousand combined with the okay. What things do I need to have in place uh, at a granular level to actually support implementing the plans that I want from my strategic plans? Excellent. Thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Uh, so the score that we do, and we have it all the way up to ten. Uh, share a little story. Uh, I, I I'm a, I'm a runner. I, I live here in Dallas. I actually um, have a, a friend that he his company was purchased. Uh, he had a software company. They were purchased by a hardware company. He came in one morning after we ran and said, yeah, these guys, they have this strange philosophy. And they, they said, they, they say, uh, good enough is good enough. And I looked at him like, what, what are they talking about? That's terrible. Why wouldn't you want to be better? And I went home that day and I thought about it. And I thought about the next day. And the day after that, we go back to the running group. And I, and I was talking to him. I said, you know, I thought about that a lot and it's probably the most simply brilliant thing I've ever heard because once you've reached good enough, why, why spend the extra money to go beyond where you need to be? Because you're, you're spending extra money for no return. So understanding your, what is good enough for your organization and achieving that is what's important. And that's part of the you know the, the the context of the organization and understanding what are our goals, what do what are we trying to accomplish here, and establishing what your good enough looks like. So, as I said before, you know, preparing a communication plan, knowing we're going to tell our stakeholders about the intentions, right? That hey, this is this is what's going to happen, right? It's actually going to make your lives better. Think about how many times you've gone to the warehouse and the parts weren't there or you got a work order and it didn't have the parts attached to it. You're trying to figure out what you're trying to do. It's gonna help you at the wrench level do that. You know, at, at the middle management level, it's gonna help you improve your reporting capabilities. You're gonna have less uh, call out wake ups in the middle of the night to, to respond to an emergency. Um, you know, at senior management level, hey, you know, stakeholders are gonna be happier. Your costs are gonna be less. So preparing that, getting it out there and making everybody understand what's in it for them is it was very helpful. They actually had a, a, a asset management policy in place. We just went through and, and tweaked and modified a little bit. Um, 
it wasn't signed by the, the, the top management. Um, when we got there, we got that done and then went to, um, you know, uh, strategic asset management planning. So, you know, taking the identified opportunities for improvement and laying them out, uh, what, why, and how of how we're going to achieve those asset management goals. <clears throat> then went to the roles and responsibilities. Right. So I, I spoke to it earlier that, you know, everything with an asset management, there's, there's something that needs to be done. So we've broken it down into what I talked about earlier. You know, we have our seven elements. Each one of those elements has six components and each component has multiple subcomponents to it. So we kind of break the whole thing down by all of these things that need to be done within the organization. And then we say, what, job position is going to be responsible for it who's accountable for it who needs to be consulted and informed right? this is extremely helpful to make certain that everything that needs to be done has somebody that's actually responsible to make sure it happens and then we take all that you know so we have the same strategic asset management plan it's going to tell us what, what are we trying to do why and how and then we can combine that with and, and create a uh, project plan, right? So a detailed project plan of what we're going to do, who's going to do it, when it's going to get done, and that strategic, I'm oh, sorry, the RACI charts actually help us identify who's going to do each part of the project plan. This is a overview of a, you know, what we call the optimized framework sample. Right. Not everybody needs the same things. Not everybody wants it developed in the same way. So when we look at it from a governor, governance perspective and we have a, uh, an area for that with our asset management policy, a strategic asset management plan, our physical asset uh, maintenance management governance procedure, and our RACI charts all live in there. And then we went into our, race, our maintenance management with the roles and responsibilities. Uh, what is our maintenance program going to look like? How is the procurement going to happen? Um, all the way down through engineering with our management of change, right? We, we see a lot of weaknesses with management of change. Um, so having that in there, it really is helpful. Uh, the capital program, which they, as I said, they actually had a pretty good capital program uh, already going. So we're able to roll that into the overall structure and uh, root cause analysis, and then finally in performance, getting the KPIs metrics uh, that align with the organization's objectives and then set up for audit. So once we have all that in place, we drove it through our, we call a reliability-based maintenance process, um, you know, making certain that the hierarchy contains all of the assets that they have and what an asset is defined as right so we set up a um, goals and guidelines around what are we going to call a, a maintainable asset make certain that the hierarchy supports uh, you know, being able to find the asset easily supports roll-up reporting and then develop our master asset list and we do our asset criticality ranking we're, we're looking at the relative criticality of the assets to each other within that system or subsystem or the overall context of that facility, that plant. So yeah, the, the goal is that, again, we go back to what's the organization trying to achieve? How does this asset help the, the organization achieve that objective? And then what are the consequences of it failing within that context? We can number all that. And then once we score it up, then we can look at how important is this asset compared to that asset in a numerical format and determine which the assets are most important to us. Then we go into our asset strategy optimization process where we use everything from reliability-centered maintenance through maintenance task analysis all the way down to uh, no planned maintenance. Uh, I know in RCM, they call it uh, run to failure. Um, it, that too often gets confused with, oh, I already have a run to failure plant program. Why do I need one? It's, it's only uh, a good plan when you actually planned it. Then spare parts analysis, just to identify what, you know, what parts based on our maintenance strategy do we need to keep these things running? How many do we need to keep? Where do we wanna keep them? And then finally into our analytics reliability uh, uh, monitoring. 
And the whole goal here is how well did we do the first four things, right? If we've found room for improvement, we go back into whichever step we need to go back to, we fix it and we continue on through our continuous improvement process. So we're actually in our second year of implementation with this client, uh, still making progress. Uh, spoke a deal that Mike that you know, we, we stalled a little bit because what we found is we were speaking to a silo and the silo went, oh, we need an asset management policy, but that group over there, no, we need to back out from this a little bit. We need to go up a level. Um, so that's what we're working on now is going back up a level and working from a higher level to, to establish, reestablish that. But we've had great, great support, uh, you know, there's activities that we can continue on with, as I said, with the reliability based maintenance, you know, that individual organization still knows what they're trying to accomplish. <laughs> uh, their, um, the context of what they're trying to do stays the same regardless of the policy. So we're able to move forward with that. And, it, and it's really helped, uh, like I said, there's, there's nothing worse than as a, a maintenance guy going to the storeroom to get your part, to, to make the repair and find that it's not there especially after you've torn it apart. <laughs> so it's really helped. So you've done a very good job of uh, answering questions as we go. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the fact that the people that you were talking to realized that they needed to take it to a higher level is a success in that cultural understanding. The fact that they did that means that they heard you. That actually sounds like a very reassuring uh, ac action that they did. Indeed. When your good enough is ISO 55,000, there is the requirement for continuous improvement to be part of your good enough. So as long as you have that as the as a, a caveat to your good enough is good enough approach, then I agree with it wholeheartedly. You just have to make sure you have that inserted in there for the continuous improvement as part of your good enough. Well, it goes back to your organizational context, right? Context of the organization, uh, understanding where you're, what, what you're trying to accomplish and making certain that you're accomplishing those goals. And yes. that context can change. When I first uh, put this forward to you, I thought we would be going over the white paper. And I am so glad you did not do that. <laughs> people can read the white paper. It's there for people to read. You have now contributed an excellent uh, set of content to the uh, ALN uh, library. And I think that uh, people from any type of organization can benefit from this, um, but specifically in water and wastewater. 